All right. So uh, welcome to episode two of the Army Radio podcast, the show where the goal is to offer accessible education to healthcare and fitness professionals alike. Uh, also to try to bridge the gap between research and the practical setting. So as per usual with our roundtable uh, discussions, I'm Dave Iman, we've got Elliot Perkins, Mike Edgar, and Ben Cernick. So our main topic for today is going to be on adherence, and we're going to be kind of taking that from the lens of more nutritional dietary intervention side of things. Uh, and that's mostly Mike's wheelhouse, so most of this is going to be us just grilling him. Um, and then if, uh, if time permits, we'll be able to kind of expand into the exercise side of things uh, and talk about uh, exercise adherence uh, in regards to like clinical rehab and stuff. So uh, before we do that, let's get started with a brand new segment. Ben, why don't you take it away? All right, everybody. Welcome to Bad Conjecture, uh, the game where we take a look at research we've never heard about and ask everyone to predict what the hell they tried to find. Um, this game show is inspired by every single researcher and student and scientist that likes to read a title and half an abstract and make a conclusion. So we're, what's going to happen is I'm going to read the title to these fine gentlemen of a recent study. All these are published this week. And they're going to tell me what they found without reading anything involved in the study. So without further ado, the first study today that we're going to look at is a study in BMC musculoskeletal disorders titled the effects of focal metallic implants on opposing cartilage, an in vitro study with an abrasion test machine. You guys have 30 seconds to tell me what they found. Well, they probably took some sort of metallic implant, like maybe like a, a nickel or a dime and put it into someone's knee and then ground it together. And the findings are that it hurt. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, I think it's a trick question and the abrasion test machine wasn't a valid um, machine. So none of the uh, results matter. <laughs> All right. So I have a little bit of a different idea. So I'm thinking they have two kind of petri dishes here and one has cartilage from a right knee and a left knee and they're shoving metallic stuff in them and then seeing if they can communicate through a wire. Wait, did you say in vitro or in vivo? It's in vitro. <laughs> Does that <laughs> Do you know which one that is? <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna stick with my answer. Yeah, I'm sticking with mine too, I guess. Okay. Um, uh, actually, I have a prediction for the conclusion. More research is needed. Uh, actually, no, it isn't. We're, it isn't. We're, <laughs> yeah. we're there you go. <laughs> so what, uh, what the authors found is that under physiologic loading conditions, when you have an implant, uh, it's okay for one hour, like the opposing cartilage, Mike's drawing is the closest thing. Um, <laughs> the, the opposing cartilage at one hour is fine. But if you keep loading it for six hours, everything breaks. What that tells us is that we should be aware of pre-existing cartilage defects when considering a metal implant. So I think Mike wins. So Mike put that in the scoreboard. So wait, so the nice. conclusion is that we need to see if people have arthritis and maybe think about that before replacing their knee because of their arthritis. <laughs> Only if they're a petri dish. Only if they're small enough to be a petri dish. Yeah. Surgery okay. first, ask questions later. I've said that before and I will say it again, yes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> one nothing for Mike. This one, we're going to take a, a, a quick switch, quick pivot, and we're now entering the archives of public health. So switch your brains to the social sciences a little bit. That's not a real uh, science. Well, who's to say? Um, the title of this study is The Caresses, all capital, The Caresses Study Protocol, Testing and Evaluating Culturally Competent Socially Assistive Robots Among Older Adults Residing in Long-Term Care Homes Through a Controlled Experimental Trial. 30 seconds. The Caresses Study Protocol. Whoever is ready, you're up. 
Okay. I think that they conclude it um, that the quality of a robot caress <laughs> is not as good as the caress of a human being. Yeah, you said it was a randomized control trial, right? It it is, yeah. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't randomized, but it was controlled. Okay, so what I'm thinking is what they had where they had robots <laughs> over here. These are our robots, and these are our elderly in the retirement home. And what we had is we actually had real robots in one group, and then we had humans dressed as robots in another group, and we were going to see who could caress the elderly population better. So, can, okay. can I just point out that I like that you're keeping score on your own page? <laughs> <laughs> it's not biased at all. <laughs> Elliot, Elliot, the caresses trial. I'm just, I'm still trying to like figure out what the acronym <laughs> for caresses is. Not an acronym, they caress the patients. Well, is this an acronym? Like, is it all in all caps when they say caresses? Yeah, so it's one of those like very classic uh, titles where the letters don't come from the, the beginning of the word. Like, you know how like sometimes it'll be like the Pontiac trial and the T will be from the word like artificial. <laughs> and you're like, that's not, that's halfway through the word. Yeah, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to sort that out. <laughs> um, I've got conglomerate of actual robots who are stuck within <laughs> some, and I ran out of time. So. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Um, I unfortunately, I, I think I have to give this one to Dave. Uh, actually, I've never seen Mark a, that down on your page. There, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've never seen three guys be so far from the right answer. Um, and what they basically found in this study is that they tried to, when they gave these people these like assistance robots, when they gave elderly people assistance robots, they tried to include like cultural programming in it. So like a better understanding of how like Japanese a Japanese person would perceive cultural norms so it was like a socially assisted robot and what they found is it's good people like it when their robot is uh more similar to their past so like what does that change from culture to culture uh I, yes that's what they're that's what this group's exploring they're exploring if that if you have a, a robot to keep your company uh later in life it's better if the robot is similar to you do they have actual pictures of the robots? No. <laughs> we all want it to see here. <laughs> really want you to. Do you guys know like the uh, the those robots that like, clean up spills in grocery stores in the U.S.? So, like like people robot. people like trap them. No, they're like six feet tall. People will like put cereal boxes around them. They get stuck, and uh, <laughs> it's kind of what I imagined for this study. But unfortunately, we didn't get a visual. That, that well, seems pretty excessive, though, when Elliot said, was it like a Roomba? Because, like, just <laughs> use a Roomba. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Let's one to one. It. Last one. This is my favorite, and I actually do think this might favor Mike. This one is from Genes and Nutrition. And the title's short, so attention spans be ready. Current basis and future directions of zebrafish nutrigenomics. Whew. Okay, so what I'm thinking here is we could either go two ways. So you don't get two guesses. You get one guess. You never said that. that was <laughs> okay, you can have two this time. All right, so I'm thinking we have zebrafish, and they're looking at the best nutrition to basically take advantage of their genes to make them really big. Or we're figuring out the way to nutritionally modify the genes to combine a zebra and a fish. <laughs> Okay, so, I mean, Mike is probably right with the second one, but uh, it, you know how, like, they, they say sharks can't get cancer because their cartilage is, and they do a lot of research on sharks and cancer research because for whatever reason they don't really get cancer. Yeah, I'm assuming, they're vascular. The cartilage is avascular, right? So the, the don't get angiogenesis in the cancer cells. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I was saying. <laughs> um, so the zebrafish they probably have some unique genetic thing that maybe they don't get obesity or something like that, no matter how much you feed them. Uh, so they are profiling the genome and the nutrition of the zebrafish because they want to unlock the cure for obesity. Dave, that's a tough one to follow. I can't follow that. I, I eat zebrafish, <laughs> make gains. <laughs> like, I don't know. Maybe there's some kind of compound in there that'll just make us all hefty. I don't know. Okay. So 
the my favorite line from this study first of all before i tell you who wins my favorite line from the study is the zebrafish animal model has been ex used extensively in this cool. in the study of disease onset and progression i've never heard of a zebrafish i don't know if i'm not cultured i don't know if you guys have heard of zebrafish i've heard of zebrafish okay yeah you, you know if you, you've seen better call saul yeah okay so you know how his brother has like the electricity thing very hypersensitive to electromagnetism Zebrafish sure. are also apparently sensitive <laughs> to electromagnetism, and he referenced it on the show. Okay. Don't ask me anything about, like, well, second year of undergrad <laughs> biochemistry. Um, don't remember that. But I remember an obscure line from a TV show. Well, it's a good thing you remember that, because, Elliot, you win this round, because they are looking at obesity in zebrafish to try to model it in humans. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Look at that. <laughs> That's amazing. Well yeah. done. So apparently zebrafish for everyone out there, um, the zebrafish are, <laughs> apparently have a, like a molecular uh, structure that is similar to the human genome enough that we can potentially look at obesity and dyslipidemia. Or we can just look at it in humans. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're discounting the zebrafish economy again here. <laughs> what's, okay. that, what's the pyramid of evidence? Aren't the animal studies at the top? Yes. <laughs> we figure out the zebrafish metabolism and get that in conjunction with the pig spines, you can really <laughs> just solve this whole thing. <laughs> oh man. Well, there we go. That's our, that's our inaugural, um, what, what, what was the uh, segment called again? Bad, right bad conjecture. Bad um, conjecture. What's if you guys bad? don't know what conjecture is, it's okay. Dave didn't know this until 20 minutes ago either. I'm still calling it Ben and Friends. <laughs> yeah. All right. So there was our, uh, our inaugural segment of Ben's Journal Club. Uh, something conjecture. Uh, <laughs> not good with the name. Uh, so we can, we can get into the actual discussion uh, in regards to adherence. And uh, Mike, we'll let you kind of take it away because you've got a few studies in terms of nutritional and, and diet adherence that you wanted to talk about. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about one major study um, and then we can kind of go into some aspects of what we think is kind of important or what we think is the implication of that. So there was a study done. I'm going to get the author's name here. So I don't picture that. Um, anyways, it was done by Wong and Ben Ham and a few other individuals. I don't really know these researchers, but overall it was a good, well done meta analysis. Um, but what they did that was kind of cool was the fact that they looked at a bunch of different popular diets and how they related not just to weight loss, but health markers. And so the big argument everyone makes all the time is, well, I need to follow this diet to lose weight, or I need to follow this diet to lose weight. But then you'll also have the other people that say, well, it doesn't matter about that. It matters about my health. So I have to follow this diet. So there's always the two camps, the one that will be like, well, you have to follow this for weight loss, or you need to follow this for health. I assume you guys have all heard about like anti-inflammatory diets and everything like that. Okay, so I think we all know from our schooling, like a, what's a good marker for inflammation usually? C-reactive protein. Yeah, so that's what they use in this generally as a sign of it. Um, I wasn't expecting to get quizzed today. <laughs> yeah, jeez. <laughs> I just wanted to like I wanted to show you that they used a very common measure for it. At least. So, anyway, so what did they find? Well, I'll go back a little bit here, but they looked at I think it was seventeen major um, forms of diet protocol, and what they ended up looking at was Atkins diet, Zone diet, Dash diet, Mediterranean, Paleolithic. Low fat, Jenny Craig, Volumetrics, Weight Watchers, Rosemary Conley, Warner's Portfolio, Biggest Loser, Slimming World, South Beach, and Dietary Advice. So, Dietary Advice was just kind of a reference group. Um, but basically, what they did was they tiered this. So, they basically had a, um, if they did better than the just Dietary Advice, they were, and they were significant, they were put into one group. But if the diets that did better than the ones that did better than the dietary advice group. So basically the ones that did kind of a tier two above, they put that into their own classification. And they looked at things, not just weight loss, but they looked at health markers like HDL, LDL. They also looked at things like C-reactive protein um, to get a better idea of if it affected their cardiovascular health and inflammation markers to a degree. And what did they end up finding? Well, this is where it gets less than glamorous. So at six months, 
there was a negligible but small difference in overall weight loss, which is okay. I mean, great six months. But end of the day, I'm pretty sure most people that do a diet, they don't really care about just looking good for six months. Their goal is to lose the weight and keep it off. So this is where it gets fun is that 12 months, what they found was no difference between all 17 diets. So, um, oh, actually, I signed corrected 14 diets. I can't count. So I just recounted it. Anyway, so 14 major diets, they found no major difference in weight loss at all between the groups, which, I mean, it's kind of expected in my opinion. I mean, realistically, where all the research is going is when calories are accounted for. I'm not talking about health at any extent here. When calories are accounted for, weight loss should generally be the same, assuming satiety is matched between groups, right? So that's not really a major thing. The argument that people will tend to make though is the fact that, well, I want to make sure my health is good. So what did they find for health markers? Well, what they found was the fact that there was actually no major difference in groups um, for HDL or C-reactive protein. So HDL, everyone knows usually is just a matter of um, good cholesterol associated with heart health, all that fun stuff. And C-reactive protein is associated with inflammation. So what they found was there was actually no major difference in either of these markers um, at six and 12 months. But we got the one diet that seemed to stand above the rest here with a small significant difference, which is the Mediterranean diet um, at 12 months for measures of LDL. So we got something here. I mean, it's nothing great, but <laughs> through in 14 diets, we got one. Okay, it's the Mediterranean diet. Does anyone here know about the Mediterranean diet? Uh, it's like, go out there. You got yes, it's like more, um, uh, it's lower carb, isn't it? Lower carb, higher fat, focus on uh, unsaturated fats. Yeah, it's honestly, I would say it's not actually even that low carb. It's, it's pretty balanced for the most part. But again, what you said is focusing more on that unsaturated fats. Um, they're built around kind of a plant-based foods diet. Um, which is a bit more actually heavier in the carbs, which would be kind of counter to what a lot of people think nowadays is just carbs are bad. Um, but yeah, so that was the major diet that seemed to show some benefit. The implications here, there were some major issues that they kind of found were the idea that they actually, a lot of these studies that they included didn't have adherence reported. <laughs> good, good. That's what, that was my first question. So thanks. So I mean, well, like, I mean, how useful is a diet if you're not following it? Probably about as useful as a rehab plan that you're not following. So, I mean, take that what you will. So um, they didn't track adherence. Yeah, I mean, maybe a little bit of a limitation here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they didn't. So, so we told we told people to eat a certain way, and then we were like, "All right, guys, you're you're gonna do it, right? You're gonna you're gonna stick to it." Yeah, well, here's the word from their study. Adherence to diet was generally not reported and could have been low. <laughs> okay. On that note, so everyone screws up on their diet and everyone's eating garbage. So there's no change between groups. I actually have a question for you, Mike. Yeah. Um, what types of um, like self-reporting um, like measurement outcomes or outcome measures are actually valid? Because like I know when it comes to exercise and stuff, there there was a study done by Nicholson um, that said that self-reported, like there's not a lot of good valid um, measurement tools, like exercise diary doesn't work. Um, self-reported scales don't work. People were over-reporting by like 20%. So, so like- In regards to like self-report for diets, it generally follows the same idea, which is what you just said, but for nutrition. The problem is I think most people probably know that nutrition is even worse for adherence for the most part than training because yeah. it requires a, more so a lifestyle change because it's affecting all aspects of their life usually because food has a cultural relevance too. And if you aren't eating what other people are eating, generally you're going to be left out to a degree. Um, so yeah, unless you're in a bomb caloric calorimetry system where you can basically have them vacuum sealed and control the heat release from their body, you're not going to know for sure. And most likely you're going to keep your results to a grain of salt. Um, so yeah, no, I wouldn't say there's any real good subjective measures. Um, you can just basically do your best to randomize. So that's about it. Um, in regards to this study though, I would say that it's even worse because they didn't even 
have a proper way of trying to measure adherence because of all the studies included. So, I mean, these results to me are kind of a fight in the wind. Did they at least on follow-up afterwards ask the patients how much they st stuck, at, stuck to it? So at six months, they generally were a bit more rigid with that. But at 12 months, it kind of, they just like, yeah, okay, we're, we're just going to see where they are. And they're a lot more loose and leaning with it. So that was kind of the major takeaway there. Okay. And were any of the participants excluded? See, I, I'll have to double check on that, but I did not, but it's a meta-analysis. So it wasn't really. Oh. Yeah, so my question for you, um, because for, for those who, don't know your entire background. You've been working with athletes, like bodybuilding athletes for, and other athletes for nutrition for a long time now. So when you, when you hear or read something that says people are pretty good at six months, but maybe fall off a little bit at 12 months, does that surprise you? I would say not at all. Cause realistically, anytime you have someone on a diet plan, if it's not something that they've built into their lifestyle, it's just going to slowly erode because motivation and self-discipline aren't really factors that are predisposing to long-term change. Um, kind of like the idea where everyone can be motivated on a certain day, but if you're going to follow something over the long term, you better hope that that is being instilled in you, not just from like an individual level, but also your social circle around you. So it's not surprising at all. The other aspect too is the fact that these diets for the most part are restrictive diets. So Mediterranean diet for the most part, when you hear Mediterranean, you're thinking of like a whole culture. You're thinking of more so a macro level type of thing here because that's what the culture is generally related to is that culture is related to olive oil. It's related to plant-based foods. So it's not too hard for a culture that's already eating like that to continue eating like that. And so at 12 months, I'm not too surprised to see that they're still getting these objective findings because most likely they're not changing their diet too much. Last time I checked, there wasn't a culture of Weight Watchers or a culture of food. So most likely counting your points every meal and having to eat a specific Weight Watchers brand of food um, is not going to most likely have long-term benefits unless you're going to somehow be doing that your whole life. So that's why it's really important to understand that these findings mainly show us that Realistically, the biggest determinant we have to look at is what someone's going to adhere to because you can have great outcomes. Let's say, let's just say theoretically they had great outcomes at six months. Is that really going to matter in the long term if they're not actually following it, which is what it's showing here at 12 months? Most likely not. Um, the other thing too is I think that the other interesting thing is there's 14 different diets here. They all generally did the same. So we can actually tend to show that they didn't do any worse per group. And I think that just kind of shows the idea that the human body is very adaptable. And the fact that people can do intermittent fasting, they can do carnivore diet and all these different things, and they're not going to die. <laughs> and not immediately at least. Not immediately at least, or at least after six or 12 months. And that realistically, just find something that works for you that you can maintain. So, mm -hmm. so do you have basically, like, sorry, do you have any, um, specific factors that you think would be areas that we could target a little bit more? Because you said like the, the social environment's a big one, right? Like if you're like even looking back to exercise, if, if you want to work out and be physically active and none of your family is and none of your group of friends are, it almost makes it more of a chore for you to have to go out away from that group and do things. Um, whereas if you're around a group, like kind of like what we were when we were in school, like everyone went to the gym and kind of socialized, it's way easier. Um, and the same thing kind of applies with food because you said like the Mediterranean diet, if it's just what the whole culture does, it's probably a lot easier to follow through. Um, and so like that environment plays a big factor. So like what other things do you think could help with somebody's long-term adherence? So I think a good support network, that can be anything from your friends or family, that could be even a coach. So I think someone to keep accountability to um, and it doesn't mean accountability in the sense where this is like a chore for you, but accountability that you look forward to accounting to this individual or you would look forward to um, showing this individual what you're doing. That can be useful. That doesn't have to be a coach. It could also be a training partner. It could be someone that's doing this along with you, like a significant other. Um, I think that's important. I think communication is important. For me, whenever I'm dealing with clients or athletes, I always tell them 
Don't try to hide these things from people. Be open and tell them what your goals are and tell them why you're doing these things and why they matter to you. Because most likely, if you're surrounded by these people day in and day out, they're going to figure out what's going on. And I would hope that they're most likely going to be supportive if you're honest and genuine with them. And for the most part, that tends to facilitate a healthy environment. The other aspects of adherence that need to be made apparent are the fact that no one's perfect and there's no such thing as a perfect diet. Or if there is a perfect diet, it's most likely not going to be perfect for you because everyone has their own limitations and barriers, whether it be work, whether it be um, obligations. So I think the big thing is to realize that you may have setbacks, whether it be uh, you go out with some friends for a night to get wings and beers, or whether it be um, you're dealing with other stressors and your coping mechanism is food. And after these events, you feel like you completely failed. Well, maybe don't see it as a complete failure. Maybe just see it as, yeah, you know what? I'm trying to learn new behaviors and mindsets, and I'm going to have times when these old mindsets are coming into play. So I need to learn to slowly change these things and just see this as a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. So I think those are a few big things. I think a lot of it too comes down to preparation. So if you want to adhere to something as best as you can, I think there's a good quote, um, uh, what is it? Uh, plan to fail and prepare, or was it? Uh, fail Pre failing to prepare is preparing to fail. Yeah, that one, sorry. Anyway can't speak but um it's the whole idea of yeah if you know you have a busy schedule and you know this is gonna something that's gonna happen ahead of time this isn't just a like a surprise event plan ahead so if you can maybe make your food ahead of time meal prep or whether it be finding places nearby that you're gonna be that offer foods that you can accommodate your dietary restrictions whatever those are that's better in the long run than just winging it to a degree and maybe at times this may not be feasible in the long run, but at least by building these habits, you'll start to learn. So, for example, um, I always found that places like McDonald's maybe not be the best choice for me because I just have digestive issues after eating that stuff. But if I go to somewhere like um, Jack Astor's, I know, let's say, the, the cook will cook the thing that I want the certain way that I want and they actually have the nutritional info available for me and so it checks all the boxes for me so I, I know a good commercial chain restaurant that I can count on or I know that chicken tends to last longer when I cook it and I can only prepare food every five days so I make sure I cook a lot of chicken ahead of time so that I have a good protein source that I count on throughout the week or I know that I tend to feel like I get hungry very often. So I make sure to cook a lot of vegetables or keep a lot of vegetables on me. So I have high satiety. So there's these little tricks you can do here and here that at the end of the day, it comes down to behaviors and just realizing that this isn't a quick fix. And it's more so a matter of figuring out how you can make your environment conducive to you versus making yourself conducive to your environment. Mm -hmm. I really like what you said about it being a learned behavior and how you are relearning. And that is absolutely applicable in rehabilitation for both exercise as well as pain where um, much like with uh, much like with care in, in rehab or pain management, even nutrition is a biopsychosocial uh, construct where, yeah, there's the biological side of it where it's actually what's happening with the nutrients in our body. But that is just as important as the social aspect of it and our own psychological needs uh uh, whether we eat to manage stress and things like that and overcoming all of these uh, different things. So really what you're saying when it comes to weight loss, for example, because thermodynamics exists um, and the laws of physics are still around, being in a caloric deficit is really the only requirement. And from there, make it as easy for the patient to adhere as possible. So make it as flexible as possible so long as they're maintaining a caloric deficit to the best of their ability, eat what they want, what they want, when they want, um, they don't have to be restricting and then personalize it to themselves. To a degree. Yeah. I think that's probably the main thing. Obviously you can try to tweak things as much as you can given their situation. So we always want to make sure you're getting a certain amount of protein and micronutrients in your diet. So we can try to accommodate that the best way possible. You always want to make sure they're getting enough water in their day. But try not to stress the little things, as you said. So 
if you can only eat two times a day, well, the intermittent fasting crowd is going to be super happy about that. They're going to love you. But if you find that you can't eat a big meal every time because your stomach just doesn't handle it and you find you're better with little small meals, well, the bros in the bodybuilding community are going to love you since they eat 20 meals a day. So I think what we can realize here is what you just said. The body's adaptable. Figure out what your goals are and what your priorities are. And make it as easy as possible to follow it. Because at the end of the day, the easier it is for you, the more likely you're going to be continuing to do it. So um, first of all, all that makes sense, obviously, right? Like how do we apply it the best to the person within the parameters that make sense to them? Um, I heard like a really good explanation of that in rehab where it was like, if you're not planning rehab into someone's day and like, if you're not asking them when it works for them, you're not providing them the opportunity to succeed in rehab. Do you like, do you see the same thing in nutrition? Like when you're working with a new, like a new client who contacts you, are you trying to like understand everything that's going on in their day? Like, how can I, how do I make the food fit around them instead of them fit around the food? Yeah, because end of the day, no one's going to continue fitting around food for their whole life. So I always try to understand maybe what their work is, what other typical stressors. Um, I try to understand what type of diet works best for them. I have clients that just like macronutrients. And I just give them their macronutrients each week because that's easiest for them. They can fit it in. And that works for their life, as you said. But I have other clients where... They don't like all that flexibility. And by giving them that much flexibility, you're actually causing them more stress because they have a very regimented schedule and day. And to a degree, as long as they understand that the foods I'm giving them aren't these controlled magical entities, I try to give them a meal plan because to them, that gives them the control back in their life. So it's all about trying to find what is best for that person and having enough tools to work towards that. It's not about having the best tool that's going to work in every situation is about having the right tool for each situation. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. Cause even like going back to, um, going back to like exercise adherence and stuff, one of the big, um, sort of, uh, my, my mic's dropping that. Um, one of the, <laughs> one of the big, um, sort of aspects there is variability and not everybody requires extra variability. Right. So like how, how do you kind of like tweeze it out to, to learn what type of person you're dealing with, whether it's someone who's going to require that extra variability or somebody that needs that like super rigid sort of one thing, chicken and broccoli. So crazy what I do is this is crazy, but I ask them first, <laughs> I ask them what maybe has worked best for them in the past, what they kind of would prefer to do. And if they've done something in the past that maybe worked for them, but they're open to trying something new that I feel may be a bit better in the long term for their flexibility, because at the end of the day, I don't want to give people, as a coach myself, I don't want to give people specific foods to eat because I find that is just going to generally build tendencies that cause you to feel like things are inherently good or bad. So ideally, I want to give them as little guideline as possible and allow them to still reach their goals. That's from a big picture point of view. But from the idea of what I find would be best for them for a diet, whether it be a meal plan or macronutrients or um, something like um, carb sparing days and carb cycling or intermittent fasting, generally that's going to come down to me realizing first thing what their demands are in their day, what has worked for them in the past, and what their current preferences are. And then from there, it's just trial and error. And I tell them ahead of time, we are going to work at doing these things and trialing it. And the big thing about trial and error, though, isn't just blindly doing something and then trying something else. It's monitoring it constantly. So trial and error is only as useful as the measures you're taking. And I don't mean just body weight. I don't mean like their, how they are looking objectively or their measurements. I also mean monitoring their emotional states, how they're feeling, and those type of things. That's only going to come from communication. So. Those are the big things that say, figure out the demands, what's previously worked for them or previously not worked for them, what their preferences are, trial and error through monitoring and open communication. I think that's like, again, from my perspective, that sounds, that's like the key to, to almost everything, right? And I think that's like, it's fantastic that if you talk to someone that is working with human beings, and you're providing a service in whatever capacity that is, if you're not incorporating all of that, you're 
you're gonna you're, yeah you sometimes people are gonna get better or they're gonna be able to stick to it but a lot of the time you're gonna miss on those people that might not be like that hyper attentive and that hyper focused person right yeah. like i think i think that's awesome like every time every time you were talking there i was just thinking about how so many times before like you hear stories of people being like oh that patient was like non-adherent they weren't compliant they failed my care and to me that's like that's wild oh like <laughs> The, the patient failed like what, what does that even mean like i that happens all the time like i know surgeons deal with that like surgeons get patients because they failed physio how does like someone fail a profession or like failed <laughs> like, like did, are you sure like how sure are you don't get me wrong this is not an anti-surgery rant this is just like, like how do you fail a profession or a service they failed conservative management they didn't fail anything but they might be ready for surgery, but they didn't fail anything. It's like, they're not failing nutrition. Like if you told them to only eat chicken and broccoli, like you wouldn't be a very good coach, would you? What did you say before you said words matter? <laughs> yeah. You didn't realize that like saying things like cheat meal or you failed care, these create terrible mindsets toward things. Like you failed care. Okay, so what? I didn't do it properly and I can never do it. Like I'm not going to respond to it and I should just give up or cheat meal like oh what i cheated on my diet and therefore i'm completely a failure like these type of words like the language needs to change that's like how that's much, a great point go ahead sorry how, how much do you think is on the practitioner and how much do you think is on the patient when it comes to them following through on adherence um i don't really think it's a matter of practitioner or patient i think it's just a matter of the relationship between the two i mean I don't, I don't know. You guys can speak to this probably more than I can from a, like a clinical standpoint. But for me, at least it's just a matter of, we talked about this in the last part, part of the podcast about the therapy of the lines. I don't care what it is you're doing with someone more likely they're going to follow through with it if they want to do it because of you. And I don't mean because in the sense they feel guilted, but if they feel an intrinsic desire to do something because you've created that instillment in them, that's, that's all that matters. It doesn't matter if that patient's 80 years old, 20 years old, you're 80 years old, 20 years old, you come from completely different backgrounds. Um, if you can at least get them to feel good about what they're doing, because at the end of the day, they're coming to you because they want to do that thing. That's probably the biggest thing I try to make people aware of whenever they come to me for coaching or even in the chiropractic clinic. If they're coming to see you, most likely you've already – won that battle so to speak like you don't need to sell them on it and you don't need to guilt them to do something you just need to remind them that you came here because you want to do x and this is how we're going to get you there and i want to see you also get there and so i i don't really think it matters about the patient or the the yeah. goals are so important right and values like Again, going back to how we're taught in school to do a history, it's more just like mechanism of injury, figure out what hurts, what doesn't hurt, and try to fix said structural problem. But like, um, that doesn't help us on how we're going to actually be able to formulate a good uh, management protocol for them, right? So like, if you actually take the time to figure out their values, what they actually really enjoy, then you can create an exercise program or a better nutritional program for them to actually follow because they enjoy it. And like in the realm of exercise, it doesn't mean going to a gym. Like if someone loves playing tennis, there's your exercise. If someone loves their dog, go play fetch with your dog or like take it for a walk. That makes it so much easier. So like a lot of our problems are probably just from not understanding our patients right off the bat, right? And it sounds like you're doing a pretty good job of actually getting down to the nitty gritty of that stuff. I just think I don't have any real, I don't care enough about specific diets or specific training plans to get an emotional bias about it. So if someone comes to me and they're like, hey, I like this, what's your opinion on it? I'm like, well, you know, like, I think that's kind of cool. Or, hey, I didn't really enjoy that. But if you're liking it, then 100%. But as soon as you start getting dogmatic in your beliefs and thinking certain things are better than other things, that's when I feel like your patients are going to fail your care, are going to fail your diet, because that's the only dimension you're looking at and you feel like it has superiority over everything else. Hmm making it personal for the for the patient yeah and we've talked about this before where like people get angry when we say like one uh, passive therapy is no better than the other right like smt and soft tissue and acupuncture and cupping or whatever like none of those are any better and people get angry about that but like i honestly think that's such a positive because then we can just shape whatever we do to whoever's walking in the door or 
whoever's looking for a service, right? Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Mike, I have, I have one last question for you, myself at least. So Dave, I know you mentioned talking about goals and how important goals are and the difference between goals and values or, and like what, like how are we going to get there? So like, I think like a, a value or like an, an end goal is fantastic to have, but I think there's so much importance in progress goals, right? Like there should be like a weekly progress goal and like a monthly progress goal. Like, and we can see that in like an ACL rehab, right? Like we have goals we want to hit, but it's a long process. So the goal is to get you back to playing sports, but you know, there's steps along the way. Mike, how do you think about that when you're dealing with nutrition? Like do you have, do you set like progress goals or like, uh, like where do you like uh, chalk in your check-ins? Like where do you try to put those in when you're working? So somewhere? usually it depends on the individual, but it also depends on the degree of their goal. Like I'm doing the competitive athlete versus um, someone that's more so just wanting to do this for their own general enjoyment. But usually I'll have their long-term goal and that's what they come to me with. I don't usually create that for them. That's, hey, I want to do this. How can we get there? But I'll set up weekly goals for them, which is what you guys probably already have and what you guys know about like performance goals. So figure out what they're doing, figure out ways to improve it. And I don't mean improve it from your own reasons for improving it, but what they see as improvement and track that in some way. So I'll use a gym example. Someone wants to lose weight. Okay, well weekly, if their goal is to lose 20 pounds over the long term, weekly we could look at what are their weight loss goals, whether this be visually, hey, there's been some improvements in this area, or weight loss, you've lost X amount of pounds in this week, let's have that as the goal, um, as a healthy weight loss goal. Or we can look at performance, hey, let's see if we can get this number hit on your training journal this week. Or, hey, let's hit that same training number, but make it easier for you so it feels easier. I think, end of the day, it's not about having a million different things to do, but just kind of finding what that person wants to work towards and what they find enjoyable each week from, the prog from a journey standpoint and making them enjoy that journey because you're going to reach the goal end of the day as long as you're enjoying what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. Yeah. Um, so we know that enjoyment is a huge factor in terms of being able to stick with exercise. Um, somebody who's doing that activity that they enjoy. Do you have any like other, like, is it possible to make nutrition enjoyable? <laughs> because like, you know, like some people might not, you just can't force someone to enjoy raw broccoli, but like, um, are there other ways that you can make it more fun? Like just a, a quick thought off the top of my head. If you take like going back to social environment and stuff, if somebody has like a giant bowl of raw broccoli that they have to eat and they hate it, it but if they go out to dinner with a group of friends in a really fun environment, is that maybe going to make it more digestible? Hmm. Uh -huh. Nice. <laughs> Honestly, I think that's like, that's starting to go from the realm of like nutrition research into more so just what you're going to deal with from the relationship standpoint with that patient or that individual. Mm -hmm. so, for me personally, I just, I try to like, cause you're, you're kind of limited as a coach to a degree in what you can do with this person. Like, I'm not going to be able to sit down with them at each meal and cheer them on about their bowl of broccoli. Um, but what you can do is you can try get people involved. So from an enjoyment standpoint, I have had clients where I make sure that I try to talk to family members of theirs or see if we can have a dialogue between all three of us or whoever they're living with and see if they can make it into a bit more of an enjoyable setting for them, whether it be meal prepping together, as you said, because that can be boring and tedious. But if you do it with someone, hey, that could be kind of fun. So that's an option. Or looking at things like having a whiteboard in your room, and every time you feel like you've succeeded in eating all your foods for the day, you can check mark it off and you kind of have a tally over there. And some people like that. Mm -hmm. or, um, some people really like the idea that for macronutrients, they can be really flexible with their food and they get to try a new recipe that made that fit in their diet. And I think it's just a matter of kind of having those small wins, whether that be again, that you said going with some friends and still being able to follow along with whatever you're doing or X, Y, and Z. It's just a matter of finding something that, that person enjoys and being able to actually enjoy the progress instead of constantly be ruminating over what their goals are. Gamification. Yeah. Always. Yeah. All right, Mike. That's like some awesome stuff that you shared.
today. I don't know if anybody else has any other input that they wanted to quickly touch on, but um, that's really awesome. And it's cool to see the crossover, right? It's cool to see you being able to apply that both in, in your own coaching setting, but also like in a clinical, clinical setting too. Patient centered approach, right? Always. That's it. Any, any departing quotes from anybody? Any, anything uh, sharp off the top of your mind there, Elliot? Um, what's that one about uh, preparing to fail is? Failing to also fail. Okay. Yeah. We can cut right. it though, right? We, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, uh, yeah, whatever. Yeah, th- yeah, we'll edit it out, right? Yeah. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> it's in a post. Yeah, we're all natty here, right? <laughs> all right. Well, uh, I think that just about wraps it up. Um, good chat again, and uh, we'll see where the next episode takes us.